Now this morning, uh, we have the uh, opportunity to explore the wonderful world of ecology. And our guide is Dr. David Skelly. Uh, Dr. Skelly is a professor of ecology here at Yale, and he's interested in amphibians, particularly frogs. He's interested in understanding their patterns and their distribution and their abundance and the development of abnormalities. His research will uncover and help, and help predict some of nature's natural patterns and also why these deformities occur. So this, we, we expect a real treat this morning. So just sit back and help me welcome Dr. Skelly to the podium. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk to a, a lively and energetic and youthful audience. I'm used to talking to crusty old people. And I know there's some crusty old people in the audience, but uh, you're accompanied by your young, vital folks. And so this is going to be fun. Um, I'm going to talk about science in the swamps today. So um, I am really an eight-year-old who got interested in frogs and then tricked society into paying me to continue to play with frogs into my adulthood and hope to keep doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do t today is give you uh, a talk in two parts. First, I want to convince you that um, there are good reasons to pay people to study frogs in particular. and um, and to tell you a little bit about what, what frogs have been able to tell us about how the world works. And then I want to use that as a segue into talking about how uh, a biologist, how a, a type of a scientist, me in this example, learns about the world. How do you confront some big question and then use patterns from the natural world to help you answer a question that uh, society thinks may be important? So I'm going to start off by just asking you to consider a frog. Um, almost everyone in this room, regardless of your age, has spent some time outside in their yard or anywhere uh, looking at these things and trying to figure out something, something about them. They're, they're, for many people growing up, that this, is, this is one of the animals that is uh, big enough to be interesting and slow enough that we can catch it and look at it. And so this is a, a picture of a barred river frog. This frog lives in the tropical rainforests of Queensland. Um, it's, as you can see, that's, uh, that's uh, an adult-sized hand. So this is a pretty, pretty big frog. And um, it, it has a very restricted distribution. It's only found in one tiny little part of northern Queensland. It lives in a place where there are monsoonal rains, kind of like today, except it's a lot warmer. Um, and so you could ask many questions about why does it live there? Why doesn't it live somewhere else? Why does its color pattern look like that? Uh, why does it have those big eyes perched up on top of its head? Why are frogs funny looking? Why do they look like that? So there's just endless questions you can ask. And, and frogs are actually really easy relative to lots of other animals to answer those questions. So the, the first reason that people study frogs is because they're so easy to work with. And so now what I want to do is step through about a half dozen examples of things we've learned from looking at frogs. Uh, one of the most famous examples is developmental biology. Frogs are vertebrates. They've got a backbone, just like all of you. And in certain aspects, lots of aspects of their developmental biology is really, really similar to how all of you developed um, when you were inside uh, your mothers. And the nice thing about frogs is that they develop, most of them, outside of their mothers. And so these, uh, sorry, Anissa, is there? Thanks. Um, these, these, this is a frog egg, we call it an embryo, and this embryo is laid outside of the mother, and this is an, a very early stage embryo, it's just two cells at that point. So when, when an egg is laid and it's fertilized, it forms a single cell, that cell starts to divide and divide and divide, and it starts to turn into something that we would recognize as an animal, and eventually it hatches. So these are all frog stages, or frog eggs at different stages. Um, in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, a bunch of developmental biologists, well, founded that field. And one of the first animals that they started to work on, because it was really handy, was the frog. And so this is a uh, fun looking guy here is Wilhelm Rue. And Wilhelm Rue discovered something that has been extremely important to uh, the history of biology and to many things that are going on today that are important to us, like um, uh, genetically modified crop plants, to cloning, to you name it. 
Um, this, this guy was the first experimental embryologist. And what he discovered was that um, even at this stage, when an embryo has just divided once from one cell into two cells, these two cells already have different fates. And the way he did that was um, by taking this embryo and sticking a hot needle into one side and killing that cell and allowing it to continue to develop. And what he got was, uh, up to the stage when it could no longer develop, a perfect half embryo. So by this stage, just within minutes of being laid, literally minutes, there's already a left half and a right half to that embryo. And when you get to this stage, every one of these cells is going to develop into different specific tissues. And by discovering this, people were discovering the basis of what in the future is going to become uh, tissue-based therapies for all of us as we age. If, you're li if you end up with liver disease, um, the hope for the future is that you'll be able to have cells put into your body that can create new liver tissues. And these guys working on frogs back in the 1800s sowed the seeds, literally, to, that, that have developed into, into that field. Another example that's closer to my own work, as Anissa said, I'm an ecologist, so I, I work on how uh, a lot of the work I, I do is, is working on what happens to frog populations. Why are they going extinct here? Why are they having developmental deformities over there? Uh, why, why are some doing well and some doing poorly? Um, I've also worked on, on how frogs deal with their predators as a way of understanding how all animals deal with their predators. Um, and one of the most astounding discoveries that has been made in this realm in the past uh, couple of decades is that animals are capable of not just going, oh, I'm scared of a predator, but changing their body shape and their body color within days. So these two animals here, and I'm, I apologize, that's a little fuzzy. Um, these two animals are the exact same species. Um, they're, they're the gray tree frog. Gray tree frogs live right around here. Some of you have no doubt seen them. If you've ever seen a frog crawl up the side of a house or up a window around here, that's a gray tree frog. They've got uh, big pads on their toes and they can crawl right up surfaces. So this is what they look like as tadpoles. And this is a tadpole that's never seen a predator. It's never been around a predator. And this is a predator over here. That's the larva of a dragonfly. And this animal is actually a little bit bigger even than this tadpole, and this thing can eat dozens of tadpoles in a day. And if you put this animal in the presence of this tadpole, within about a week, it turns into this animal. This tail is deeper, the tail muscle is bigger, and the coloration turns red. This animal is much harder for this predator to eat. It's, it, it's better at getting away. And the red tail, this red flag back here, tricks the, the predator into striking towards the tail, which it can survive, versus the body, which it can't. So it, you often find, uh, when you go out into nature and collect these things, these animals with bright, bright red tails, but part of the tail is missing. So that's a great strategy. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's something that we see not just in gray tree frogs, but in other species. And it's something that people studying frogs have taught all kinds of ecologists. This is where this was discovered, in part because these changes were so obvious and so easy to study. The next development I want to talk about is um, cryobiology. So some of you who are adults in the audience will remember a few years ago, uh, I'm a Red Sox fan, and so when Ted Williams died, it was very sad. And then it was even sadder when there was all this business about his children fighting over whether his body was going to be frozen or not. And so that's, that's a field called cryogenics. So the reason that people pay lots of money, tens of thousands of dollars, to have their relatives frozen after they pass away is, be, is based on this hope that someday we're going to be able to bring people back to life. We can freeze them solid and bring them back to life. And NASA wants to do this to astronauts. So you parents thinking about whether you want your kids to become astronauts, take that in, into mind as you uh, encourage or discourage them. Um, but there's a lot of interest in this. And people think about it like it's science fiction. That's crazy. Well, it's not crazy at all. It's just we're not sophisticated enough to do it, but frogs are. So this is a gray tree frog here, and this is a wood frog. Both of these species live right around here. And right now, today, they're probably wishing that they were frozen because it's just a little too warm, and it'd be much better just to be kind of out of it rather than sitting there getting rained on at this temperature. So 
This animal is absolutely completely frozen solid. Its heart is not beating. If we brought this animal into a hospital, the doctor would say, that's, that's a dead frog. Same thing for this one. But these frogs aren't dead at all. Um, these frogs are in uh, a torpor that allows them, so a, a kind of a sleepy state, that allows them to completely shut down their heart. Their heart is not beating. Their blood is absolutely frozen. There's no brain waves. There's nothing going on. But what I'm going to show you in the next slide is an example where uh, somebody took a wood frog that was completely frozen and allowed it to thaw out. So we're going to be all modern here and hop on the web. So this is uh, some work that was done at Miami University. And all they're doing is uh, thawing out a wood frog. And what I'm going to show you as it goes along is um, a 10 hours that's condensed into two minutes. So what you're going to see first is one of these uh, crusty looking frozen frogs. And one second of this video footage is going to equal two minutes in real time. So when they show the eye blink, it's going to happen a little bit fast. So this is at 20, 28 minutes. There's initial melting of the skin. So this is a, a completely frozen frog. Okay? And they're putting it at higher temperature. It's sitting on a, a bed of sphagnum moss. And there's not much going on. I doubt I could get you guys to stay here for all 10 hours of this if we weren't speeding it up. But at, after 3 hours and 12 minutes, you're going to just notice very little twitches in the eye right here. See that? OK. Pulmonary breathing returns. Pulmonary just means the lung system. And so after almost four hours, we're just going to see, if you look right here, you'll see the nose just twitching a little bit. OK? So this animal's starting to take oxygen in for the first time perhaps in months. So if that's happening, it probably means that the heart has started to beat a little bit and the blood is being pushed around. Six hours, we, we get the first movement of the limbs. Okay. Yeah, you have to imagine what this would feel like to be frozen solid and then be gradually thawed out. You, you know, if, if you sleep in a bad position, you know how you're really sore when you're first waking up. You can see why this might take 10 hours for this animal to come out of this. And so now you're going to watch. Now things are going to speed up. So now this animal, after 10 hours and 4 minutes, is ready to roll. And it's going to say, see you later. I didn't like being filmed. <laughs> and you can see the breathing really fast. And it's blinking, and it's just going, what happened to me? So why is that a good idea? These animals live in an environment that you all live in. But you all live, uh, most likely, in centrally heated homes. Um, that regulate the temperature. Sometimes you may complain that it's too cold or whatever. But what you're complaining about is nothing like what a wood frog has to deal with. It's just sitting underneath the leaf litter out in the forest. And that's going to get down to below freezing. And the only way that it can deal with it is, is by having, allowing itself to freeze. Wood frogs are amazing animals. This, this is the most widely distributed frog in the world. It lives down in Georgia. It lives up at Hudson Bay. It lives, same species as up on the north slope of Alaska, beyond tree line. So the only way that it can have such a broad distribution across most of North America, it's also out in Wyoming, and it's right around here, is because it has the ability to tolerate a huge range of conditions. And it can spend most of the year like this. And then 10 hours blinking, and it's off. And it's ready to do, do whatever it needs to do, breed, feed eat flies. OK, now what I want to do is talk a little bit about just the diversity of uh, frogs that have evolved. And um, many of you who are familiar with frogs at all will know the kind of life history, the kind of sequence of life events that a wood frog goes through. The eggs are laid in the water. The wa they develop into tadpoles, not unlike those great tree frog tadpoles I showed. They spend a few months like that. Then they metamorphose into these cute little frogs that you see sometimes in the summer. Those then grow up, and they repeat the process. Um, there are many other ways to, to do this, though. And this animal lives in South America. This is known as Pippa pippa. That's the species and the genus name. Um, they're also called leaf frogs, and you can kind of see why. They're very flat, 
really bizarre looking animals. They don't have any tongue. Most frogs, you know, use their tongue to catch things. This animal lives underwater all the time, so it's got a big, wide, gaping mouth, and it's got these big hands, and it stuffs things into its face using those hands. But that's not the most bizarre thing about it. Um, here's an example for all you moms out there. Um, the moms lay the eggs on the father's back, okay? <laughs> And so the, the male carries the entire clutch of eggs. And those of you who have had twins can look at this and think, wow, um, that's, that's quite a, a large number of babies. And not just that, uh, and I know some parents feel like this, the children actually grow into the male's back. Okay? <laughs> and they continue to develop. And what this is showing here is birth of this frog out of the back of the father. There's the head. There's one little arm already looking to eat something before it's even all the way out, and it's just going to swim off and say, see you later, which kids do as well, don't they? Um, so I wish I could say that's the most bizarre, but it's, it's not. So this is an African bullfrog. This is one of the largest frogs out there. This animal is extremely territorial. These are both males. And while frogs don't generally have big teeth, they do have these big bony tusks sometimes. And these male bullfrogs, uh, sometimes you can see this on Animal Planet, have these battles where they can kill each other, fighting over different spots within a pond. Um, and these animals can get quite large. So this is, this is a little baby that's just turned from a tadpole into uh, what we call a metamorph. And there's a cricket, so you can see that it's very small. And a few years later, it can be that big. And that is a, a normal scale kid. That's not some trick. Um, so, these, these animals get really large, and you can imagine this is a formidable animal. This male, again, object lesson for us, the male guards the tadpoles in the pond. It shepherds them around. If the pond starts to dry up, it'll even dig a trench into the deepest part of the pond so the tadpoles can move. And if anybody, including a biologist, tries to mess around with those tadpoles, it will attack using those tusks. Um, there are other groups of frogs that you may have heard about. These are uh, uh, dart poison frogs that live in Central and South America. All of these bizarre and wildly different animals, at least in color patterns, are all in the same family. So they're all very closely related, and they've, they've developed into all these different colors. Does anybody know why they might have these very bright colors? Excellent. So they're warning other animals against their lethal poison. If you're going to be a tiny little edible thing crawling across the ground, um, most, most frogs have that coloration like that barred river frog I showed in the beginning where they can blend into their background. These guys clearly are not blending in at all. And they are filled with toxins that can kill things that uh, try to eat them. And that's why the Central and South American indigenous people used to um, unfortunately, take the points of their arrows and grind them into the frogs and cover uh, the tips of their arrows with this poison. And then if they were hunting, they could shoot that into their, their prey that they were hunting and immobilize it much more quickly. Um, does anybody know how the poison gets in there? Next row back. From the arrow? Well, the, it go, the poison goes to the arrow. Okay, so, th so it turns out that they get the poison from the, what they eat, from the ants that they eat. And if you go to uh, a zoo or an exhibit where these are shown, they're not being fed the poisonous ants, and they're not poisonous. Now, that is not a recommendation to go try to eat one of these. I'm not saying that. But um, uh, they, they're much less toxic when, when they're raised in captivity. But that is not, I think, the most interesting thing about them. The most interesting thing, once again, a father story, a happy father. I'm a new father, so I'm telling happy father stories. Um, so this is uh, the blue jeans frog. This is one of, and you can see why it's called the blue jeans frog. It's got these blue, blue pants on its legs. Um, and this is one of the, the, the dart poison frogs. And it, the, the female lays the eggs in bromeliads. A bromeliad is a kind of a plant that maybe you haven't heard that word before, but if you've ever seen a pineapple, you know what a bromeliad is. That's a type of a, a, a bromeliad. And there's a cup of water right in the middle here. And so the frog lays its eggs in there, and then the male comes back after a few weeks and sticks its, its backside into the water, and the tadpole, that's a tadpole, crawls up on its father's back. And then 
the father takes it to a new bromeliad so it can eat the food in the new one. And they do this for months until this, this animal develops far enough so that it can metamorphose and become another adult blue jeans frog. And last but not least, on this vein, um, we have what is kind of, some people even think, an ugly frog. This is the gastric brooding frog. That's a kind of a crazy name. This is another frog that lives in uh, Queensland, um, in Australia, where I've, I've done some of my work. Um, and this is kind of an ordinary looking frog, but it's a, actually a really, probably perhaps, the most extraordinary of all frogs. Uh, this is not what it looks like. This is not a parent frog doing an awful thing to its, its baby. This is oral birth. So the, the female, in this case, eats the eggs, ingests them into her stomach, and they develop there, inside the stomach, and then develop completely to, uh, to metamorphosis in there, and then she burps them up. Okay. <laughs> And, and the, one of the questions is, how does that happen? You know, if, if you tried to eat one of your babies, it would digest, <laughs> right? So these things somehow have the ability to turn the stomach acids off and, and are, are able to complete development. And in the 1980s, there was a lot of interest for people with ulcers of trying to figure out how that happened. So there must have been genes that could turn this off. And I've started to use the past tense because the sad thing is that this animal's extinct. So this is one of the species from all around the world that in the last 20 years has gone extinct, and we really don't know why. We're starting to get some clues, and, and I'd be happy to answer questions about that at the end. Okay, so now I'm going to segue into the second part of my talk. So this is me out in a pond looking confused. Um, and so I, I'm being an example here of, of a scientist, and I'm a kind of a scientist. I'm a biologist, and I'm, I'm going to go out and try to figure out how nature works. So I've, I've given you a whole list of interesting things that people have found out using frogs. And so my job is to try to add to that. So to take the, what we know and then somehow build on it. So how does that happen? And the example I'm going to talk about is something that some of you may have heard of. So starting about uh, 10 years ago, there were reports all around North America of frogs with very bad developmental problems, deformities. Um, and this picture here from the cover of a book that you could buy in airports and stuff, A Plague of Frogs, the horrifying true story, shows uh, one kind of deformity where the frog is, is, uh, has just a tiny little leg. And this is not a good way to be if you want to grow up to be an older, healthy frog. Okay. This animal, if, if you put it down on the ground, hops around in circles and says to every heron within 100 yards, come eat me. So while we see deformed frogs and we find old frogs, we don't find old deformed frogs. Okay. This is an animal that we collected, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But you can see here, it also has a deformity. And you can't see the other leg, but the other leg did too. So this animal is also in big trouble. So one question is, um, does it matter beyond what's happening to these poor frogs? Does it matter for frogs? And then maybe, does it matter to us? Because frogs, like I said before, have backbones. They have a lot of the same genes we do. If there's something out in the environment that's causing frogs to have developmental problems, we probably should ask the question, does it matter for people? Because this frog was collected, in particular, from part of the public water drinking supply in Vermont. So if there was something in that, in that drinking supply that was causing developmental problems in another vertebrate, we should know that. OK, so some people think that the reason I go to Vermont is so that I can go to Ben and Jerry's and get free ice cream. Um, and there is a limited amount of truth to that. So we, when we selected the places we were going to uh, sample in Vermont, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, uh, one of the places, and I swear it popped up at random, we didn't do this on purpose, was uh, the pond next to the corporate headquarters of Ben and Jerry's. And it turned out that the people that worked there on the weekend were very nice to us, and we got to try all the newest experimental flavors when we went up there. So that was certainly an added bonus. But the real reason we were up there is because uh, Vermont has had bad deformity problems. So before I get into talking about that, um, I want to ask all of you the question, do you know what causes these kinds of, of deformities, if you've heard about it? Yep. Uh, poisons in the water. Poisons in the water. OK. High amounts of ultraviolet light. 
pollution, yeah, in the back? Somebody had their hand up. Okay, over here. Um, acid rain. Acid rain, okay. One more. Um, the cells don't copy exactly. So the cells don't copy themselves exactly. So maybe there's a developmental problem for some reason. Okay. All right, Those, that's, that's, a good, that's a good job. So here's the list that, that the biologists that study these things have been uh, working on for the last 10 years. So in, in answer to the question, what causes amphibian deformities, there have been four main ideas that have been thrown around. One of them is that it's being caused by predators. So predators are uh, chopping off parts of the legs of frogs, and for a variety of reasons, that can cause a variety of deformities to happen. I'll talk about that. Um, one is one that was mentioned, ultraviolet light. So maybe there's too much ultraviolet light out there because we're altering the chemistry of the atmosphere, and that's leading to these problems. Another one that nobody mentioned, but is actually the one that has gotten the most attention, is uh, parasites um, infecting these animals and causing developmental problems. And I'll talk quite a bit about that. And finally, um, people said poisons or pollution. And, and that's definitely one of them that, that people have thought about some, although probably the least amount of work has been done on that so far. So the Vermont story started in 1996. So just, just about 10 years ago now, people went out fishing and, and boating on Lake Champlain, and they started reporting to the state government on kind of an 800 hotline that there were problems. They were seeing frogs that had the wrong number of legs and were hopping around in circles. And when the state biologists went out and started to look, in some of these places along Lake Champlain, so here's the state of Vermont, and here's Lake Champlain running up the western uh, boundary of the state. And that's where these reports came from. They started finding um, places where one third of all the frogs had bad leg deformities. That's, that's really high. And it was even enough to get Ted Koppel up there and, and go out and figure out what was going on. Um, and it was pretty much centered on leopard frogs, this species. And it went from all the way down here at Pulteney, Vermont, all the way up to the Canadian border. So all along here, they were finding these problems. So it was very wide scale. It caused uh, people in Vermont to get a, very interested in this. This is a report that was produced about the fate of frogs in Vermont. And so there was a lot of attention on this, but not, no real answers. So what we started doing a few years ago was going up there to try to figure out what's going on with Vermont frogs. We had those four ideas that I showed you to begin with, and our job you know, we're essentially being paid. We had a grant to do this. Our job is to go up and figure out which of these makes sense and which of them can we eliminate. So what we did was we went up and studied a large number of ponds. One of the keys in science is sample size. You have to look at a bunch of places, not just one. Because if it's just like studying, if you want to stu figure out, you know, whether smoking is related to lung cancer, it, it, you can look at one person, but you get much better answers if you look at a whole bunch of people. Um, so the same thing is true here. We're going to have to go to a bunch of places. We restricted ourselves to the part of the state where this had initially been reported, but we actually extended the, um, the area that we were going to look at. We weren't just going to look right along the shoreline of Lake Champlain. We were going to look at the Champlain Basin, which is actually uh, maybe 50% of the state or more. And so that goes all the way down to the shoreline from the top of the mountains in the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, and we, we're going to look at the characteristics of these ponds, in part to see whether ponds that have lots of deformities are somehow different from ones that don't. Um, and we visited each place lots of times. Uh, this says three or more, but really we ended up going to each one of these places many, many times. And um, each time we went, we collected up to 100 individuals of each species we encountered of both amphibians and snails. Now, I haven't talked about snails yet, but I will more, and that'll, that'll make sense for why we're doing that. And that allowed us to look at parasites, among other things. Okay? Um, so we have, to, we have to collect these animals, and we have to kill them in order to, to, to figure this stuff out. And that's another part of biology. Um, if any of you have been in a class where you've dissected a frog, that frog was sacrificed so that you can learn about this. So we have to be really careful about figuring out what we're doing so that we know how many individuals we're going to need, and we collect no more than that, because we don't want to become part of the problem for these frog populations. We're trying to figure out ways of, of helping out. And so this involves lots of field work. So this is Susan Bolden. She's the research technician in my lab. And so she and I and others who I'll, I'll list at the end went out and did a lot of this work. And that's another part of biology is that this kind of field biology is a tremendous amount of work. It's lots of fun 
because you get to be outside. But you get to be outside on nice days, which is nice, like when I was eating the ice cream on the grass and when this picture was taken. But you're outside on days like this, too. And you can't just say, gosh, I'd rather be in watching TV or something. You've got to do it anyway. If you're on a schedule that says you're going to be here on that day, you're there, even if it's grueling and ugly out. OK, so I'm going to step through each one of these four ideas and talk about each one of them and why it may or may not make sense. So predators, first of all. Why do predators potentially make sense as a cause? Well, it turns out that something horrible called limb grazing is common. So th this, is, this is kind of a tough idea. You've got all these baby frogs out in their playground hopping around, or not hopping around, swimming around. And while they're still swimming around, they've got a tail that they're using to swim, but they also have their legs developing. And if a predator comes along, maybe it's a fish, Maybe it's another frog. Maybe it's some kind of insect. One of the easiest handles that they can grab onto if they're trying to grab and eat that tadpole is the developing limb once it gets big enough, that leg that's sticking out. And sometimes when that happens, they, they actually eat the limb and they don't get the rest of the animal. So that leaves this kind of evidence. I'm sure all of you at home have your field guide to malformations of frogs and toads. So that, that turns out that's a real book. And uh, under 11C, you can see trauma, limb amputation. The terminal margin of the right femur is blunt. So that means the leg is blunt. And it's irregular. Yep, that looks irregular. Red and swollen, indicating trauma. So this animal somehow met with something that, that chopped its leg off. Um, and hemorrhage can be seen, so that, that blood right there. So it turns out that predator attacks, as you could imagine, Having your leg chopped off le leads to bleeding, it leads to scarring, it leads to changes in the pigment, the coloring. Um, sometimes there's exposed bone. And sometimes, and this we don't see in people, although some people wish we could do this, frogs can regenerate. So some of you may know this. This animal may be able to regrow its leg. Okay? If it happens at the, in the right way and this heals cleanly, frogs and salamanders can start to regrow that leg so that by the time several months have gone by, that animal could look close to normal. But even when that happens, you can still tell something happened because there's the scarring and there's changes in the pigmentation. So in short, what we did is not to say this doesn't happen, but we eliminated it from our sample. So of all the animals we collected, if we saw any evidence that put us onto 11C, we, we cut it out. We just said, we're not going to count those. Okay? It turns out that we saw some of that, but not that much. Um, it, it's, it's happening, but I wouldn't say it's at, at very high rates. But we were just being very conservative. We were being very careful to make sure that that's not what we're studying. Because people don't think that this is probably a big problem. It's not something that's changed a lot in the last few years that would lead to all these people all of a sudden seeing these deformed frogs. So we're going to eliminate that one from consideration using the methods that we're gonna, going to adopt. The next thing is, is one that somebody mentioned, and that's ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light had been linked earlier with amphibian declines. So some populations, particularly in the western U.S., were declining, and uh, it was linked to ultraviolet light causing a disease in the eggs. So when people started seeing these limb deformities, they started asking, well, maybe ultraviolet light is related to that as well. And so some people at an EPA lab out in Minnesota did some very good experiments that showed that, first of all, ultraviolet light in too large of a dose, too much, can cause leg deformities. So it absolutely can cause leg deformities in the laboratory. One of the things they found, though, is that it only causes one class of problems, missing legs or parts of legs, and it happens in a very particular way. It's always both legs, and it's always identical. So this animal here is missing both of its legs at the same point. So that's consistent with this idea. Ultraviolet light might have caused that. But this is what most of our animals look like in the sense that it's only on one side. Almost all of our animals, over 99%, the two legs look different. Okay. So what we can do just on that basis is throw this idea out. And, and we're not doing anything that the EPA people didn't do themselves. So they were good, responsible scientists. They showed that, yes, it can cause leg deformities. 
but they figured this pattern out and they looked themselves at what, what people were seeing all around the country and they decided that this red X should go here themselves. So they threw it out. And that's really important. Some of the most important scientific discoveries that are made are ones that allow us to say it's not that. Because remember, we started out with four ideas. We've got to get down to one if we want to be able to say something, or at least know that there's more than one of those that they're operating, and maybe they're interacting with each other or not. But we want to get down to the list of things that really matter and discard the ones that don't, just like doctors do when they're trying to figure out how to treat disease. We have to know what really matters and, and, and winnow it out from what doesn't. So next I'm going to talk about parasites, and I'm going to talk about a particular kind of a parasite that's been associated with these leg deformities. So Trematodes are probably not something that many of you have heard of. It's a kind of a parasite. This is a picture of, of one life history stage. And like a lot of parasites, it has a bizarre life history. So what happens to it during its life, Hollywood couldn't even made up. Um, yeah, so what is a parasite? A parasite is an animal that lives inside of other animals, and it makes a living off of being on the inside of somebody else. And I hate to break the news to you, but all of you have parasites. It's been said that if we all of a sudden made everything on Earth disappear except for nematodes, which is just one kind of parasites, you'd be able to see for that split second the outline of every living creature because there are so many of these things in all of us. So there's something to think about for the rest of the talk, and now you won't pay attention to anything else I say. Um, so there are lots of parasites out there. And in fact, this is the dominant form of life if, if you're either counting species, how many species are out there, or how many individuals. Because every host, so this is a host, this is a host, this is a host, has many parasites in it. And every species of host, and you're a host and I'm a host, has many different species living within it. So this is life on Earth. Most life on Earth is parasites, and it, but it's this kind of hidden thing. And all of us want to think, you know, most people in this room, if you ask, are you healthy or not? You'd say, yes, I'm healthy, but we're also infected. So being infected is not inconsistent with our own ideas about our health. But if we said, if I, had before, if I hadn't given you this little spiel and I'd said, you know, I know you have parasites, does that mean you're healthy? You might have said, well, gosh, no, that's, that's not normal. But in fact, it is normal. To be, to be infected. But sometimes these infections can be of the wrong kind or um, they can be super intense and they can cause health problems. So uh, trematodes are in that class. If any of you have ever heard of swimmer's itch or had it, that's when one of these things, a trematode, is trying to infect a duck. And I'm not saying anything about your legs, but it thinks that you're a duck and it swims into your leg instead of a duck's leg. And it causes, it doesn't, it doesn't manage to infect your legs, but while it's in there trying and dying, it causes a rash. And that's what swimmer's itch is. Okay, so you're swimming, that's where you get it, and you itch, and you do. Um, and there's other diseases that are actually really serious. Uh, schistosomiasis is a very bad disease that infects people all over the tropical world, and there are almost as many people infected with that as there are AIDS. I mean, it's a big, big problem, and it can be lethal for kids and older people. Um, so there are certain kinds of diseases caused by these things that can be really bad. But there are many other uh, animals and plants that are infected with uh, trematodes that don't even notice it. Okay, so the life history of this thing goes like this. This is a heron, and the heron is actually right here. It's got a frog in its mouth. So herons eat frogs. And if this frog is infected, it's going to be see it standing in the water, and, and when it poops, that, that is going to have the parasite eggs in it. Those eggs are going to hatch out, and they're going to swim around and find a snail. And when they go into this snail, they uh, form these uh, breeding complexes. Uh, there's not a better word for it. And they do, if any of you guys have seen Alien, the movie, some of you are probably too young and you shouldn't see Alien ever. <laughs> but what happens is that they grow up inside this snail and take over the whole body. And then when it warms up in the springtime, this thing is going to explode. And Thousands of these things are going to pour out, and that's the end of the snail. And then these are going to swim and um, infect a tadpole. And so it's this process of infecting the tadpole that many people think has been linked to 
these uh, developmental problems because this parasite doesn't just infect anywhere on the tadpole. It infects right there. That's where the hind limb is going to be. Now, if you think about it, this is not a bad strategy for this parasite. It wants to get eaten by a heron, right? If it doesn't get eaten by a heron, its life is over, okay? It can't move on to the next stage. It can't um, infect the next stage by, by laying eggs. So what better way to do it than to mess up the legs of the frog that you're living in so it can't get away from the heron? And so people think that this might actually be an evolutionary strategy to help these things get eaten by this and complete this thing's life cycle. Evil. Okay. So let's think about why would this be linked with, with limb deformities? How does this work? And what I'm showing you here are um, animals that were experimentally infected with these uh, riboroia. So that's the species that can cause these deformities. Um, so this animal was experimentally infected. This animal was experimentally infected. This animal was experimentally infected. A couple of these look kind of bizarre. This looks almost like an x-ray. Um, and this animal, it's not an x-ray. It's called clearing and staining. So if we want to look inside of an animal, we can actually put it in a series of solutions that turns all the flesh clear and then dyes the bones and the cartilage different colors. And that allows us to see if there are any parasites in there. In this uh, x-ray right here, what you can see is an arrow that's pointing to a bunch of tiny little dots. Those tiny little dots are trematode cysts. So after that trematode swims in and burrows into the limb bud, it puts a little shell around itself and it just sits there and waits for the frog to get eaten. In this case, the frog didn't get eaten. It got caught and photographed. <laughs> and, and we can see there that there's a concentration of those cysts there. And so what scientists were able to do using a bunch of really clever experiments is show that just the, just the presence of those cysts, not anything that they're excreting or secreting or anything like that, pushes the cells apart. And when your limbs were developing, when you were just an embryo, you had a little paddle-shaped hand, or not even a hand, just a little limb bud. And the way that you got a thumb and a first finger, second finger, and so on, is because a field set up of concentrations of hormones in your, in your little limb bud. And this part of your limb bud said, I am a thumb, and don't you dare over there become a thumb, and sent this signal across the developing hand. And this one said, OK, I'll be a first finger then, and OK, I'll be the second, and so on. And that's the way you get a differentiated hand. Well, if, if, if someone had been uh, nasty enough to put a bunch of trematode cysts in between the cells that were going to turn into the thumb and the rest of the hand, that cuts that chemical communication off. And you can get multiple le legs developing. You see this thing's got two feet and two bones here. It's a big mess. And so they were able to show that because what they did was they, they took little plastic beads that were exactly the same size as these trematode cysts, and they surgically put them into a limb bud of a frog. And they repeated this many times, and they got the exact same thing. So it's just the physical presence of those little parasites in the developing limb that can do this. So now the question is, is Riveroia the answer in Vermont? And the answer so far is we don't know. This, this sounds like it could be something that we should investigate. And so what we did is we went up to Vermont and we looked at the pattern of deformities up there. And one of the things that we found is that um, there was a real bias. Almost all the deformities we saw were one kind. So before I said that there are two main classes of deformities. So there's where you're missing something. So this animal should have another leg right here. This is a, a metamorph. So this thing still has its tail, but it's got a leg here and it's got its four legs here. There should be another hind leg here, but it's just not there gone. So that goes in the missing column. This animal obviously has some extra legs. So we put it over here, extra. Now, you know, if you think about this and you were a TV news producer and somebody gave you two pictures, which one would you put on the news? This one. And so almost all the newspaper, magazine, and uh, television coverage has shown this business. But as I'll show you, this is the business. This is what's going on out in nature. So that's what we found up in Vermont. Why is that important? That's important because people have done these experiments I talked about when they've infected animals with this parasite, Riboroia. 
So these are all experiments. So none of these animals would have been infected except a, an experimenter took half of them and said, okay, you're in the control group, and the other half, and they gave them some of these parasites and allowed them to infect the limb buds. And then we ask, how many of the deformities involved missing stuff or extra stuff? So if this number was zero for this species, this is Bufo boreus, the western toad, if that number was zero, it would mean all of the deformities involved missing elements, like what we saw in Vermont. If it's 100%, and it nearly is, that means all of the deformities seen involved extra limbs, like the television frog I showed. This is Pacific tree frog. It's biased the same way. And the leopard frog, biased the same way. So these are the only experiments anyone has done where they've experimentally infected these animals and then looked to see what happens. And we get this pattern. Now remember, what we saw in Vermont is the opposite. Very few extra limb deformities out in nature. So that's inconsistent with what people are seeing when they do these very careful experiments. So we got a problem. So what we did is, is we asked the question, um, if Riberoia was present in Vermont, what would the deformities look like? Okay, so if this was the answer, what should we see? And we did an experiment up at the Yale Forest where we took uh, Vermont leopard frogs and New York uh, Riberoia, and I'll explain why we had to do that in a minute. Um, and we reared, reared them up to metamorphosis, and this is what we found. This is an extra limb deformity. So even though we're not seeing these very much at all out in nature, that's all we got out of these tanks when we did the experimental infection. Okay, another problem. We've got an inconsistency. The big news, though, is that Riberoia is not present in Vermont. We have looked and looked and looked until we were ready to scream, and we can't find it. So we've looked in 50 different ponds. We know that that host snail that it's coming from, the right species, is there. There's only a few species it can use, and they're there, and they're abundant. So we've looked in the snails. We've looked in the frogs. And I have to add that we know what we're doing. Because when, when, we've, when we've presented these results to people who believe that trematodes are causing this stuff, even though we're all scientists and we're all adults, um, they say, well, you just don't know how to do this. You don't know how to find them. But what this is showing is that um, we can go over to New York State, where we got those Riberoia for that experiment I just showed you, and in 10 minutes, we can find Riberoia over there. So they're present in upstate New York. That's where some of the researchers who have looked at this are from. And this is showing a little bloody spot next to the limb bud of this tadpole where we just had released some Riberoia. And they go right into the limb bud. And then we followed this guy. And we get a picture like that one that I just showed you of the extra limbs. But it's not there. It's not out there in Vermont. And we did some digging around in the literature. So when scientists talk about literature, they don't mean Charles Dickens or Dr. Seuss. They mean all these really boring papers that almost never, none of you have ever read. And maybe if you're lucky, you never will have to. So these are all published papers where people put their results out there. And then people can read it. And I'm just kidding. You should all learn how to read that. Otherwise, you have to trust these newspaper and television editors. Um, so anyway, this is, the, this is just like that figure I showed before where this is 50% of extra limb high malformations. If it's above that, it means we've got television frogs. If it's below that, we don't. We've got mostly deformities of these missing uh, limbs. And this is a whole list of species. And what you can see is that there are only five bars that cross this line where most of, of the limb problems are extra. Okay? And all of them except one are this H. regilla. That's the Pacific tree frog. And there's one exception here, and I won't get into it, but, but the, the, this has an asterisk next to it because these people only looked in ponds where they knew Riberoia was present. So they're kind of stacking the deck um, in, in doing that. But basically what it means, with or without that caveat, almost everything that's going on out in nature looks like Ver what we saw in Vermont. Okay? So the story is a missing limb story. We did another thing just to make sure, just to double check we weren't off track. So maybe there's some other trematode out there that we don't know about that can cause these deformities. And what we did is we, we looked at a bunch of deformed animals that we're going to call cases and a bunch of controls. And the controls in the cases were the same species. They were collected on the same day from the same pond. And we asked, 
of those two animals, and we're matching them up with each other, which one had more trematodes underneath its skin? And to do this, we have to dissect all the skin off the animal and count every little trematode cyst, and they're just fractions of a millimeter wide, and my people in my lab hate me when I make them do this. Um, and if, if the answer was they have exactly the same number, every point would fall exactly on that line. If we got the answer that was suggesting that the trematodes were causing these problems, then the points should be down in this area. The ones that have the deformities should have more cysts than the ones that don't. And the answer was things are lined up pretty well on that line. So nothing going on there that suggests that other trematodes, not Riberoia because it's not present, other trematodes have anything to do with, the, with what's happening. So there's a very strong case against the trematode idea for Vermont. Most importantly, Riberoia is not there. And without Riberoia present, there's a big problem with the hypothesis. Nearly all the deformities are also missing legs. They're not extra legs. And what that means is that um, we don't have a pattern that's consistent with what we see from Riberoia anyway. And our experiment is consistent with that. And we're double checking, and we don't find any evidence that other trematodes that are out there are associated with this problem. OK. So let's go back to this list. There's one that I held out on you and one that, that, that you mentioned when I asked you what's causing these patterns, and that's pollution. So we didn't go up there specifically to study pollution. People who study pollution, environmental chemists and others, have to use very expensive, very specific techniques. And we just didn't have the money for that in our grant. But we were keeping our eyes open about this. And so what we did instead, since we didn't measure pollution directly, what we did is we asked a question. We asked, if pollution was causing these problems, what would the pattern look like in Vermont? And one of the things we were particularly interested in is whether uh, if a pond was near agricultural fields where pesticides are being sprayed, or people's lawns where sometimes chemicals are sprayed, or where septic fields are and so forth, whether those ponds were particularly likely to have deformed amphibians. And what we found was, as many of you know, Vermont has a lot of agriculture, and in particular dairy cows, right? Well, those dairy cows have to be fed something. And usually, it's, it's corn that the, the dairy farmer grows right on the, on the farm right there. And they spray pesticides and all kinds of things on there. And what we found is that frogs that grow up near these agricultural fields have more than twice the likelihood of developing a leg deformity. Now, that is not the same as saying we know it's pollution. There are other reasons that this could be going on. And this is often the way science works. I've been working on this problem for several years. And what I've been able to do is knock some of those things out. Now, that list was not created by me. Other people created that list. And what I'm left with on that list is that one line there, pollution. And so instead of saying, concluding by telling you pollution's the answer, I have to conclude by saying pollution is the next thing that we have to look at. That's where we're at. So it looks like the patterns are consistent with that, but we don't even know what pollutant could cause this. There's many, many unanswered questions. And that's the good thing about you know, this whole employment messing around with frogs thing. You can always come up with a new problem that you can try to sell to somebody to, to keep you going. So I want to finish up by, just by reconsidering the frog. So frogs have taught us lots about nature. We've been able to use them to answer all kinds of questions. And the good news is that we have accumulated a huge amount of information about this one kind of animal. And now we can use on that. We can build on it to ask other questions. And maybe we can get to the point where we can understand what's causing these kinds of problems so that maybe we can figure out how to make that not happen anymore. Now, um, just as Anissa said when she was saying there are a bunch of behind the scenes people out there, um, the other part about science is that science is done by teams of people, large teams of people. And many of the people up here are, are the ones who are actually out there doing a lot of this work. There's, there's people who have, have to have very specialized skills um, in different arenas. So some people are good at going outside and finding these things. Some people are really good at identifying parasites. Some people are really good at dissecting animals. And some of those people are all right here. And the other part of this is that science is not cheap. It takes money to hire these people to do these things, to buy the equipment to do this stuff. And so we've had lots of people to help out. And uh, finally, I wanted to finish by thanking all of you for listening.